Hey there, we are so grateful that you are joining us in a part of our church today and that you're jumping in to watch this message. Hey, I'm Jay, one of the pastors here at Covenant Church, and I'm so grateful that you would be a part of our church family wherever you are and wherever ever you're watching from. Maybe today is your first time watching our online or experiencing Covenant Church. You're new and just checking things out. We get that. And, and we're glad that you're here to do that. Would you do us a huge favor? We would love to get connected with you. So text the word NEW to 252-304-0222. We have a gift for you and one of our team members would love to follow up with you. This is just our way of saying thanks for being here. Well, let's jump right into this week's teaching time. Again, thanks for being here and have a great day. Uh, this is our sermon series, which we're calling Lessons Learned, and it is the story of Gehazi. And um, just to review, Gehazi in the book of 2 Kings in the Old Testament is the servant, or we might say the apprentice, to Elisha the prophet, who is one of the greatest prophets in the whole Bible, certainly one of the greatest in the Old Testament. And um, he serves the Lord as the leader of uh, Israel. So they're, they're, he's their spiritual leader uh, serving the Lord. And Gehazi is his right-hand man, which means that Gehazi has a first-hand view, front row, view of everything that is going on in the spiritual life of the entire country as he watches Elisha. And so in this series, we're, gonna, we're asking the same question every single week. Will Gehazi learn the lessons that God has for him as he is watching the work of God through the man that he is serving. And vicariously, I would say for us, the question is, will our hearts be open enough to receive the lessons that God has for us? And my prayer is that the answer will continually be yes, that, that we will be able to uh, have a soft enough heart so God can teach us. And there are some really good lessons in the message today. Now, uh, if you were here last week, you know that we, we started the series by looking at the account of the healing of this man named Naaman. Naaman was the commander of the Aramean army, which is the Syrian army. And he came to Elisha because he had heard that Elisha might be able to heal him. And he was healed of this terrible skin disease called leprosy when he humbled himself and did what Elisha told him to do, which, of course, was to get in the nasty, muddy Jordan River. And by the way, I read just this week that they're trying to get more people, Israel's trying to get more people to come visit the Jordan River. And so they're going to put a, uh, a cleaning plant north up, in, up on uh, uh, an area ahead of where they want people to visit so that when they get there, the Jordan River will look better. So you see, it's still a problem. People don't want to get in the Jordan River and be baptized. And so here is this man, he doesn't want to get in, but once he humbles himself, he is absolutely healed. And uh, when we left the story last week, he is riding back to Syria, to Aram, with a chariot load of dirt that he is going to take. And he says, I want some Israel dirt, some earth so that I can build an altar. I don't ever want to forget what happened to me there, and I don't ever want to stop worshiping the one true and living God. 
Now, there was one other part last week. I, we kind of looked at it briefly, but I want to expand on it today. Naaman brought an offering when he came because he figured that he needed to bring a gift or he might even need to pay Elisha for this amazing miracle. And so he, he brought some money, and we, we read about it last week. He brought 10,000 talents of silver. He brought six thousand, excuse me, 10 talents of silver, which is a lot of money. He, he brought, he brought 6,000 shekels of gold, and he brought 10 sets of clothes, which also would have been very valuable in that day. So in our economy, that would equal about a million dollars. So that's quite an offering, isn't it? Guy brought a million dollars, and he, after he's healed, he brought this back to Elisha and asked him to accept a little something, a million dollars. Please take what I have brought to you. And uh, this is what it says in verse 16. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. So he says, no thanks. I'm, I'm not going to take a dime from you. What I did was from the Lord and not from me. Go and have a good life. Now, Gehazi, as, as you remember, is right there. Uh, he saw everything. And uh, when he hears... Elisha say this, he thinks that he has lost his mind. How do you turn down an offering like that? Okay, by the way, if any of you want to bring a million dollar offering, we will accept it. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, he, he, he thinks that Elisha has lost his mind. And so this is, this is what he, he, he sees Naaman right off with all that money and all that, I mean, all that worth. And he sa it says, Ga Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. Now, before we move on, I want to show you something here. There on your insert, both of those, uh, what Elisha says and what Gehazi says, they're both there. And if you'll notice, they're almost the same. They're almost the same sentence. Elisha says, as sure as the Lord lives, I won't take anything. And Gehazi says, as sure as the Lord lives, I will. But there's one little part that is different. You might, if you've got a pen. You might just circle this, this little part. Uh, it, Elisha says this, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve. In other words, what he's saying, whom I am accountable to, whom I'm listening to, who I'm following. Now, Gehazi doesn't say that. So that, that's the, the part that is different. And, and I don't know, have you noticed a lot of people love to use God's name? They love to add it to their conversations. Some, I, I would say some people like to put God's name on their plans. And um, I, I think some people that use God's name, surely they are serving the Lord. Other people just want to sound spiritual. Okay, that is what Gehazi is doing here. As surely as the Lord lives, this is what I am going to do. So he takes off after Naaman. And listen, things get worse. He catches him. He catches this entourage of chariots and horses. And when he runs up, Naaman is alarmed and gets down from the chariot and says, is everything okay? I mean, you're in a hurry. I mean, you, you're out of breath. And Gehazi says, everything is okay. But 
after you left, now listen to this, after you left, Elisha, um, he remembered that there were uh, some needy people among us. In, in, in particular, these two uh, sons of the prophets, which are the people, in the, these two students in his uh, prophet school, and uh, they, they are in a bad way. And he was wondering, he's changed his mind, he was wondering if he could get a little of that gift. I mean, he remembered your incredible generosity. Could, could he get a little bit of the money and maybe uh, a couple of sets of clothes? All right? Now, are you all with me on this? This is a big, fat lie. Because Elisha didn't say that. What did Elisha say? As surely as the Lord lives, I will take nothing. So this is a lie. And Naaman doesn't know it's a lie. And so he was glad to give it. In fact, you know, he had a generous heart. He was glad to give the whole thing. So he, he says, sure, sure, I take as much as you need. And so Gehazi ends up taking uh, some of the money and two sets of the clothes, and ends up taking about a fifth of what Naaman had. So that's a couple hundred grand. Okay, it's still, that's a lot of money. And he takes this, and he goes back to the house, back to his room, and hides it, stashes it away. And then... He goes back to his regular spot and is there right beside Elisha like nothing has taken place. And it is not five seconds before Elisha says, so where have you been? Now, this is a dilemma, isn't it? What are you going to say? So, I mean, go home and read it. It is so great because Gehazi says, Oh, I ain't been anywhere. <laughs> I mean, what, what makes you think I've been somewhere? I, I hadn't, I, I, it's exactly what it says in the text. I, I haven't been anywhere. And this brings me to the first lesson today. A pretty important lesson. Listen, if you have to deceive to get blessed, then it will end up not being a blessing to you. So see, first of all, you know, he lied to Naaman. Now he's covering up a lie with a lie. And he says, well, I, I, uh, I, haven't, I, <clears throat> I haven't been anywhere. I, I, haven't, I haven't done anything. And so, you know, I, I think this is probably how it worked out. He doesn't look, he doesn't look Elisha in the eye. Because you can't look, you know, you can't lie and look somebody in the eye. He's going, well, I, didn't, <laughs> I hadn't been anywhere. I, I, you know, everything's, everything's fine. Then I love this. L look what Elisha says to him. Verse 26. Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? This is when Gehazi is going, how did he know that? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or men servants and maid servants? In other words, now he, he doesn't, he says, you know, I was with you when you were telling that man a lie. And he says, is this the right time for you to have what you took from him. And then he adds some stuff. He adds, you know, olive groves and trees. I mean, you know, herds and flocks and servants. And Now, he didn't get any of that from Naaman. But Elisha knows the man's heart. You know, you, your heart is not right. And he says, is this the right time for you to have that stuff? Now listen, God loves to bless his people. But if, if you've got to lie to get it, steal to get it, cheat to get it, connive, 
concoct a lie, whatever it is. If you if you got to go to all that trouble to get it, then it, it's probably not the right time for you to have it. He goes, is this the right time for you to have those things? And so what we have here is yet another time where Gehazi fails to learn a lesson. He's right there. He sees the work of God, but he doesn't learn what God has in front of him. And the, the consequences this time, by the way, are going to be devastating. Verse 27, Elisha goes on. He says, Naaman's leprosy, this terrible skin disease, will cling to you. And to your descendants, how long? Forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and he was leprous as white as snow. And I'm going, wow. I mean, boy, don't lie to <laughs> Elisha, right? I mean, yeah, he told a lie and he stole a little money, but I mean, golly, he, he ended up with he ended up with leprosy. And and that's terrible enough, but this leprosy is going to be a part of his next generation and the next generation, his children, his descendants. He made a bad decision, and it is going to last and last, and forever is a long time, isn't it? He says, this is going to follow you forever. And that just, I don't know, I read that, that just doesn't seem fair. You mess up one time. And, you know, your life is messed up. And not just yours, but you mess up your children's lives and your grandchildren's lives because of one bad decision. But you know what? That's exactly how it happens. It, it, it's usually a series of things, but, you know, it starts out with one bad decision. And you say, well, what I do doesn't affect other people. Yes, it does. It's, it's called a generational curse. It, what I do, I won't deal with it. What ends up happening is it just gets passed down to the next group. And they don't deal with it. And it just gets passed on to the next group. It's like it sets in motion a cycle, this poor choice, a cycle of poor choices or a cycle of sin or a cycle of addiction or a cycle that can't seem to be broken and it just goes past to generation after generation. I mean, haven't you noticed that there just seem to be some people that their family is always stuck in poverty I mean it's like how, why is that are they do they just have bad luck or is it you know poor choices passed down generation after generation you, you know there are people who seem to be uh, I don't know stuck in relational failures you know, it's like they have a relationship failure and then, and then another. And then it's like, well, hadn't they had enough? Can't they, can't they have a break? And then it's another. And then turn around and look. It's like they're, that's, that's their whole family thing. Just one mistake, one heartbreak after another. Um, I, I've got... I've got people that struggle with alcohol in my family and I've just been amazed you would think that if you watch someone who is an alcoholic that you would say not me but if you look at the statistics uh, the um, <clears throat> the children of alcoholics a lot of times they'll end up being alcoholics I mean it just it's like a decision made just keeps getting passed down and passed down until someone has the courage to say, I'm going to stop it. 
I am going to stop this cycle today. I'm going to make a, a different kind of decision today. I'm going to break the pattern so that not only do, can I change my life, but I want something different for my children and their children, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You know, until you do, then your situation is forever. And I don't think anybody wants that. You know, stuck in hopelessness, or it, my situation can't be reversed, or this is going to go on and on, I'm always going to be a failure, I'm always going to struggle. I mean, it's an embarrassing thing, it's a painful thing, it's a lonely thing, and that is Gehazi. It says he leaves, how sad is that? The, the apprentice to the prophet of God in Israel has to leave. He, he goes away and... It's all because he wanted some money. Now, how many people do you know who have made a poor choice because they wanted some money? And that, that's really Gehazi's thing. And so here he goes from being like, you know, walking uh, with the, uh, the, the man of God to being a social outcast, having to live with people outside of the community for the rest of his life. <laughs> anybody here feel like they're stuck? Anybody, anybody here say, you know, I mean, I, you don't have leprosy, but it's like you got something that is keeping you stuck. And... You're ashamed of it, or you're tired of it, you want it to change. Well, it can change, but it's got to start with a different decision. And if, and if you don't decide, what you'll end up doing is you will just pass it along, you'll deal with it, and then you'll, you'll pass it along. It's, it's the way these things work. There, but there is hope, and that is why I'm so excited about Gehazi's story. All right, so he is white as snow, leprous, white as snow. Chapter 5, verse 27. So let's skip ahead. I want to show you Gehazi again in chapter 8, 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 4. It says this, the king was talking to who? Gehazi the servant of the man of God, and had said, tell me about all the great things Elisha has done. And I'm going, no, wait, wait, maybe I'm out of order here. Isn't this the guy who got banished because of his leprosy and it was going to last how long? Forever. It's going to last forever. I mean, I, I mean what in the world has taken place here. I mean, here's a guy. He is now currently the servant of Elisha, the prophet of God, and he is talking with none other than the king of Israel himself. Hey, something happened, didn't it? Something happened between um, chapter 5 and chapter 8. Because this guy was doomed. There, there was no hope. There was no cure. There was nothing anybody could do for him. But something has changed because now Gehazi is a different man. That leads me to the second lesson. This is great news for people like us. You ready? No forever situation has to remain a forever situation. That means where you're stuck, where you think there's no hope, where there's nothing that can be done, that it does not have to be. There are choices that can be made in people's lives. Now listen, sometimes, I don't know about you, I can be a little Eeyore. Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, you know him? 
things are bad. Things are just getting worse. Nothing can be done. It's hopeless. It's going to be forever. But listen, the, the Bible teaches that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. There's no sin that is beyond his ability to forgive. There is no situation that is beyond his ability to redeem. Because that is the kind of God that he is. If we will allow him to work in us if our hearts are open. And so something happened to Gehazi. Because, listen, lepers are not usually invited in to hang with the king. I mean, this is when a leper comes to the king's door and says, hey, can I come in? They, they send someone out there to throw him out on his ear. All right, so here he is talking with the king. Something has happened. So let me just take you back. We're going to spend more time on this next week, but here's the short version today. All right. Chapter 7, verse 3 and 4. It says, Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. Uh, let me explain what that is. There's a famine in the land. They say, hey, we're starving to death. There's no food in the city, no need to go in there. There's no food out here where we are, no need to stay here. Now, I know they have food in the enemy camp. Why don't we go over there? If they kill us, we're going to die anyway. But if they give us some food, at least we'll have some food. There is food there. They're proactive. They get up and they go. Four men with leprosy. Now, can you guess one of those guys' names? All right, here they are. They're just outside the camp. Here is Gehazi and some other lepers, and they're trying to figure out what to do. And the Bible says that, that the most amazing thing happens on their way. No one ever could have come up with this scenario, but the Arameans who are there to fight the Israelites hear something. It's, they, they don't know what it is, but they think it is the enemy coming to get them. And they just continue to hear, and it gets louder, and it sounds like horses and chariots. And they get so scared, these soldiers get so scared, that they run for their lives. They flee the camp, and they leave all their supplies behind. And so when these four lepers show up, they walk in, and there's already supper on the stove. And so these starving men find something to eat, and they're thrilled. They don't, they, they, it's beyond their wildest dream. And, and there are other things, too, because they left everything behind. Look what it says. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothes, and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. So there's food, but there's also silver, gold, and clothes. Have y'all heard this before? You don't, you don't know where that came from? There's silver, gold, and clothes. This is naming stuff, right? And, they, and so they take some of it, and they go off, and they hide it. Then they go back, and they get some more, and they go off and hide it. And then there is a moment of recognition. And listen, this is what God is looking for in everyone's heart. A moment of recognition where someone says, wait a minute, I've been here before. One of those lepers says, wait a minute. Silver, gold, and clothes. Um, hey, we got to stop this. We got to stop this. And this is what he says. This is not 
right. He says, I'll tell you one thing. If we take this silver, this gold, and this clothes, and we go hide it, we are going to get caught. And they go, oh, we won't get caught. He goes, oh, we'll get caught. He said, and Elisha will see exactly what we're doing. And I've been there before, and you don't want to be there. He said, this is not right. Let's stop, and let's go to the king, and let's tell him about all this treasure. Now, how about that? This man, Gehazi, has finally got it. He has finally learned a lesson. And here's the lesson. This is lesson number three. God will continue to test you on the same lesson until you pass. Now, it's not like school where if you stay long enough, they're just going to move you along, right? No, it is, it is, you're going to be tested, and if you fail, then you have to go back to school, learn a little more, and then God will give you the opportunity to retest. Now, think about this. Naaman, how, you know, he kind of failed the test, and then he got retested. It took him seven dips in the Jordan River to pass the test. To learn his lesson. It took Gehazi seven years. There's a seven year gap here. It took him seven years to learn his lesson. It took the Israelites 40 years to learn their lesson. They got retested all the time, right? And then it was like, here, stand and see the Lord your God. And they grumbled, and God said, why don't y'all turn right back around and go out there again? You hadn't learned your lesson. Took them 40 years. My question is, well, how long is it going to take people like us? Sometimes people learn quickly. Sometimes it takes years. It takes years to get it. Think of all the wasted time. That's, that's what we call forever. How long is this going to last? Forever until someone decides to make a change. Until someone decides, I'm, you know what? I'm going to put different answers on the page this time because I, I keep failing this test. Now, the bad news is every one of us has failed a test. Every one of us has failed a spiritual test in our lives. The good news is that God is willing to retest us, but he didn't want to waste his time. He, he retests when he thinks we're ready to take the test. When we make a decision that we're tired of the forever that we're in, and it's time to make a different decision. You know, really, the, the prayer is something like, Lord, would you show me where I keep going wrong? Will you show me the decisions that I keep making that keep putting me back in the mess that I'm in right now? And every one of us runs upon those kinds of tests. You see, it really has nothing to do with your salvation because Christian people have places where God tests us to take another step in our faith. You know, it's, it's, it's those that have faith that get tested, right? So we take further steps. We make changes. We decide, I, I want there to be something different and more, and I don't want my children to have to suffer because I wasn't willing to take a step. Listen, how many people do you know that live in a spirit of lack? When that is, that is not what God teaches about himself. He says, I will, I will provide everything that you need in Christ Jesus. You know, it says this in the scripture for us. There's not a, a limited supply, but it people believe a spirit of lack or a spirit of complaining where instead of learning to praise, we learn to complain. 
or a spirit of worry. Well, you know, my mother is a worrier. My grandmother is a worrier. I guess that's why I'm a worrier. Well, that's a generational curse. Someone's got to stop worrying and have faith. Or maybe it's a spirit of fear. I don't know. I'm just always afraid. Well, the, the word that is used in the Scripture more than any is, trust me. Trust me. Do not be afraid. Right? Maybe there's something that is keeping me, a decision the, or the way I'm living, the way I'm choosing that is keeping me from being the man of God or the woman of God that I'm supposed to be or the husband that I should be or the wife that I should be or the parent that I should be or the son to my parents or the daughter to my parents that I should be that I need to change today or maybe there's just this one thing I'm ashamed of it but I won't tell anybody and I won't let anybody help me so I'm willing to just stay stuck forever well, y'all, not me. 